Hello. Well, today I'm joined with uh, I'm joined by um, Mark Goodwin, recovering deputy head teacher, uh, and I'll let him explain that title himself in a little while. Um, but currently works with um, young people at risk of exclusion and with schools who are um, trying to improve their exclusion numbers. So I'm very excited because you'll know that exclusion is something that's very close to my heart and something I feel very passionate about. And it's such a big issue um, currently. And I'm certainly getting lots of phone calls from virtual schools asking me to support them in bringing down exclusion numbers. So Mark, presumably that's one of the things that you do, but maybe you'd like to introduce yourself and just kind of what's with the um, recovering deputy head? Where's that come from? I think that um, as, a, as a deputy in a secondary, in large secondaries, um, the, the nature of that job um, means that you become a little institutionalized in some respects. Um, the, uh, the focus is, is on results. Um, the focus is on um, school improvement. Uh, the focus is on the, the big O and uh, the demands of Ofsted. Um, and you do as much as you can to uh, individualise and connect on an individual level with students. But the nature of the job in a large comprehensive puts a, a big distance uh, between you and the children, between you and, uh, and teaching. Um, and I accepted that as uh, one of the costs of becoming a school leader and, and moving up the ladder. Um, I was um, working towards headship, um, but, but circumstances uh, happened at the school I was at, um, which forced me to really consider what I wanted to do. And what I'd always been passionate about was engaging students in learning, um, helping students, even the most disaffected students, to connect with school and learning and hopefully a subject that they can get passionate about and i uh, teamed up with a colleague uh, and we set up uh, reflective school support uh, to work with permanently excluded students um, alongside that i uh, put all my um, training teaching and learning behavior specialism uh, into my own company which is a training company um, and those two uh, elements of my work now run uh, alongside. Um, recovering deputy, uh, I think what I've appreciated um, in the last year is um, what I was really most passionate about um, and um, the opportunity every day to teach again, um, to um, uh, engage with, to build relationships with some of our most disconnected students uh, has been a revelation really and what I was always passionate about um, 20 years ago when I, I started teaching. Um, so I, I, I don't mean to be flippant about school leadership and the demands of school leadership but I have learned much more in the past year about all of the elements of the teaching job than, than I had done in the previous uh, 19 years and I'm no slouch with my learning but the work I've been doing recently it's given me incredible satisfaction, but I've learned an awful lot myself. How, how fascinating though, and I think it's really interesting to hear that. And one of the, the great things about going to lots of different schools, working with lots of different people, is that you develop much more of an overview of different ways of doing things and ways that people respond in different circumstances. It, it does build, nourish and grow that database of humans. But I'm really interested in this disconnect, not least because I'm, I have had many a private conversation where I've been concerned that actually um, some of what I'm passionate about and what I'm trying to get schools to do in secondary schools, I'm not certain that secondary schools, the way they're set up, are equipped often to be attachment aware trauma sensitive environments that support and nurture children and young people and I realise that's probably a really controversial thing to say but I just find that when I go into some secondary schools and I see even things like the way the building's structured, the way lessons are structured, the way departments are structured, the, the entry into that role even which is very subject driven 
I'm curious as to how that works, um, how, how schools can really, secondary schools can really not have that disconnect. I've seen some very positive things with restorative approaches. Uh, that seems to work quite well in secondary schools, uh, if the will is really there. But I mean, what are your feelings about that? Am I being really too pessimistic and a bit drastic? <laughs> I think you've been uh, very um, uh, realistic, um, very honest about what you must see on your, uh, with your experience around schools and um, what, what I experienced in, in the schools I was in, but what I see now, I see schools um, operating in a system that, uh, that operates against, I believe, against those building relationships, against those connections. Uh, we have become very uh, results driven. Uh, that has uh, developed a high stakes culture that um, puts um, results above the human being, above the, uh, above the child. Now, there's a strong argument to say that those results are for the benefit of the student, but too often we can lose sight of the human being in our quest for um, the result. Um, I think schools have become, um, some schools uh, have become places where um, being a teenager, um, <laughs> I, I'm trying not to be controversial myself I suppose, but being a teenager and making mistakes and getting things wrong, um, finding things difficult for whatever reason um, is, is not, uh, young people aren't given the space to experience that. And to learn from it, um, one mistake can be ca catastrophic. Um, one mistake, uh, one poor relationship with the teacher can result in, in exclusion, permanent exclusion even. Um, I, in my work that I've done in the last year, I really try to um, uh, withhold judgment about schools. Schools do what schools do. And I've been on the other side of the... Uh, table um, on exclusion as a deputy. I've been in those meetings. I've been in those very difficult meetings uh, around exclusion and even permanent exclusion. I, I really retain judgment uh, on the schools that have uh, permanently excluded the students we work with. Um, however, um, you do wonder at the um, uh, approaches uh, the, the behaviour approaches, the understanding some schools have of the needs of, uh, of young people because um, permanent exclusion, the permanent ex some of the permanent exclusions I've seen uh, have led me to question how that student has been worked with, uh, what's been said to that student, um, how they've been worked with when they find things difficult in the situations they're in. Um, and uh, I withhold judgment because I want to move forward and what I'm trying to do is help the parent and the student to move forward from it and uh, in, in some ways there has to be a disconnect with the process that they've experienced but I, I do raise um, a very large uh, eyebrow about um, some of the approaches schools have. Um, and we're in a very, very um, interesting time where there's a kind of polarisation and let's face it, that is what is happening in the world right now. We are in this very polarised world, but and, and like, like the rest of the country on various issues, the education system is no different. And on this spectrum, we have this zero tolerance punitive approach on one end and then a, a much more restorative relationship based approach on the other and then a whole range in between. Um, and, and I guess it's always interesting, really. I mean, it's sad for me to hear you say that you've observed students um, being excluded and you wonder how on earth that came about. Because if we challenge that zero tolerance approach um, or we talk about exclusion and uh, behaviours that... Uh, schools find challenging we can often be greeted with you know I'm talking about Twitter conversations we can often be greeted with um, the the notion that uh, schools don't exclude easily uh, which I would hold that I don't think schools um, exclude easily from what I've seen um, and that somehow having any kind of nuanced discussion about it means that we are being critical and saying that schools are just willy-nilly 
excluding but actually there's a great big space in the middle where we should be having a much more open and honest conversation about some of the things that you're you know you're talking about and that we yeah, both yeah. see in our work i think um the, the um we've lost the idea that there might be a gray area um, yeah. a middle ground um you, you you mentioned nuance but um so much of uh behavior management is about um is, is just simply it depends and to say that there is a um a binary response to behavior uh is um is just really limiting uh, to all professionals who work with other human beings to say that there's only one way to deal with a behavior um i um when i talk about behavior i talk about gray areas and i talk about depends and, and you're right lisa that there's uh that can uh, um generate a barrage of criticism just for even suggesting that there might be this uh more more, more thought out approach um I, I try and cover that um with um the notion of responsibility uh, when, I, when i speak to the young people um you know, we, we i talk about three things and I, I talk about potential which i think is really important um wh whatever's happened um we've got to rebuild and give a second chance. So I talk about potential, which is the future and, and hope. Uh, and I've got a few things that I, I do to, to build that. Um, talk about relationships, obviously. Um, these are young people whose relationships have been absolutely shattered. Um, they see school entirely negatively. Um, but I also do talk about responsibility and that the student has to um, uh, do certain things. Uh, a school is a school is a school, and um, how they uh, how they respond and how they speak, how they can conduct themselves, you know, how they uh, show up um, is it, all in their hands. And uh, I I bring in that element um, in the hope that that demonstrates that um, there is a balance that can be had uh, between. Uh, so when people say. I'm all about relationships, or I'm all about um, um, uh, something um, restorative, or, or something at the uh, progressive end. Um, I do so well. It's not binary. There's something in between, and there's something almost outside that spectrum. And outside that spectrum lies. I I I always thought as a, as a teacher that um, teachers knew that you think about the needs of the child, you build a relationship, um, you bend and you flex as the grown up, uh, you manage yourself in a way that uh, would get a reaction uh, and not this one size fits all, you do as you're told, high control, um, which I, I, I just find uh, bizarre that that's become anybody's currency if I'm, I'm quite honest yeah and and it does it does sometimes open up the questions really about do you like children you know do you actually enjoy being around the energy yeah. of children and young people because it is a very particular energy i love it you know um yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah and um yeah i i as um as a, as a newbie to all of this, um, I've, I've kept out of those zero tolerance uh, arguments um, and I really admire people that have engaged with it and uh, challenged um, those, um, the, the, those suggestions. But my, my view is that I looked at the teachers at the start of my career who I wanted to learn from and be like, and the teachers I didn't want to be like were the um, extreme disciplinarians the the ones who spoke of breaking children uh who punished who i thought punished um unnecessarily and um disproportionately and i looked at those teachers and it just it reminded me of when i was at school and those are the teachers that i failed to connect with those are the teachers i wanted to take on those are the teachers that i you know felt that it was my job to challenge and all through my career i've wanted to be the 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 teacher that um one with, with with kids that connected with kids and got the best out of them not controlled them or uh discipline them um and so uh 
the, the work I do now, um, I mean, the, um, what, I mean what, what I, it's easy for me to say is that the work I do now, if I went in with a zero tolerance attitude, I would get nowhere because that is what has broken these kids in some cases. So uh, I have to do something else. Um, and I think uh, I look at the, um, the, the professionals and I look across the sector, alternative provision, special provision, and uh, people do this because it's, it's what works. It what, it's what uh, nurtures the child, it what help every child to matter, it what grows the child. But certainly my work, it, if I went in with a, you will do as you're told, um, this is what we're doing today, there is no question, I've got no chance. Um, and what's interesting is you've been teaching, uh, you've been in education for over 20 years and what, what I'm hearing you say is that there's nothing new about this kind of zero tolerance approach, but it does seem to have a different language now um, because I, that, that has come from somewhere. All of a sudden we speak about isolation. We speak about, you know, exclusion units. We speak about zero tolerance. This is a language that I wasn't familiar with. Now that, as you're quite rightly saying, that doesn't mean it hasn't always been present but I'm wondering what's driving that narrative um, and that language. Is it, is it, uh, is it, is it, <laughs> is it because schools are just so under pressure themselves? Is it because of the, the root quick, in education? It's quick, fixes, isn't it? Yeah, it's quick fixes and you can quickly turn around a school um, if you uh, go in a uh, hard line, um, if you go in my way or the highway, um, if you're going, this is the way it's going to be. Um, and um, I've seen that done. And of course, you'll have an impact uh, because you will um, uh, move on. Uh, the more difficult uh, students, either uh, formally or informally. Um, and um, I think there is a, you're, you're right, there is a language around this that has become currency um, around behaviour. Um, and uh, it's, they're, they're uh, a very wise uh, head teacher that I, I still keep in touch with. Uh, it taught me a few things, but one of the main things he said is that if you walk around with a hammer, you'll find yourself plenty of nails. And that idea that you know, if you're always looking for challenge and confrontation, you can find it all the time. But that's not the way to deal with young people. Um, there's a different way to deal with young people to get the best out of them. Um, and it doesn't involve a hammer. Um, it's that hearts and minds, that's where you connect, that's where you win, and that's where you get the best out of students. Um, I mean, to be completely controversial, Lisa, the, um, there's a, a government approved approach to behavior. Yes. Um, and there's some very clever language. Um, one of the most dispiriting is that, which has become co common currency, is that um, you know, some young people are removed because they are affecting the learning of the majority yeah. uh, and this idea that they have to be removed so that the others can learn i mean whatever happened to you know community inclusive we all get through this together mixed ability um, the skill of the teacher to bring the best out of the class uh, and manage even students that don't get it and find it difficult mm. um, that's not to say that students sometimes need time out or, or need a uh, time out of the classroom and need uh, need to work uh, with somebody individually but the, the amount of times more recently I've heard that that kid needs to be out get them out of my classroom which I, I didn't hear that uh, so much in the past. Mm. And it's very compelling argument isn't it it's very compelling that this child is taking away from other children who want to learn they are fit to learn they are ready to learn unlike this child who is ruining this the whole educational experience for everyone else it's very compelling uh, for parents you know who are you know very, very rightly passionate about their children's education why should their education be disrupted and interrupted because the whole language is not as you say, community-based, uh, restorative, relationship-focused. Okay, what's happening here? How are we struggling with this? Because the, the curriculum, it strikes me, is just so jam-packed with everything else that there's no opportunities left for those kind of skills that are actually skills that support 
how we work together, how we are neighbors together, how we commune together, how we organize our communities together. Surely a school is a place where that's, that's uh, something that's learned. I mean, in a community, if you have, you, you don't just remove uh, people that you struggle with. I mean, yes, if people do certain things that have a criminal nature, then we have the criminal system, there's the mental health system, both of those systems will remove people. But generally, communities are about, like you say, how we kind of learn to be uh, with people that we might struggle, struggle to be with, you know. And, and, and how much, um, you know, we've, we've all learned as adults, um, how much is to be had you know, the, the, the positive effects on us, how we've benefited from that communal experience. And I think about clubs I've been part of, I've played sport all my life, I think of the, the friendships that I've still got. I think of the workplaces I've worked in uh, over my lifetime and th those bonds and those friendships that come from communal uh, interhuman uh, interactions and it, it's ups and downs and it's rough with smooth, but you learn yeah. how to, and you learn how to challenge and you learn how to love and challenge and um, work with people and um, work things out and, uh, and get on. Um, and I think we're losing a, a bit of that um, where people, where it's seen that you can just, it's about me, it's about the individual, it's about what I need. Um, and nothing should um, impact on that. I mean, we, schools reflect society, I think, and we, we see a more um, uh, atomized society, see people you know, more isolated, uh, people are pushed outside, there's others, there's them, and um, that's reflected in school, I think, sometimes. We don't want those sort of kids, we don't want that sort of behavior. Um, that, and, begs, uh, that begs to me a kind of sociological question really which is do schools reflect uh, society or or can society reflect schools you know can can schools have a part to play actually yeah. in making the best schools the best schools now at least are, they're countercultural. i think um you see schools that make a stand about inclusivity about diversity about restorative about relationships and and they are actually you know countercultural. i think that um and all power to them all power to the the heads and the teachers that make a stand for, for all of those values that are, are so important but uh increasingly are being lost in in wider society where people are more confrontational uh, are more individualistic um, uh, these are, yeah, I, I mean, countercultural uh, is something that I've really thought about the last few months that you, you find yourself saying, but, but I don't see it like that. And you see what the best schools do. You see what the best practitioners do. You see what the, the experts do. And, and they're speaking against what is, um, what, what is happening more widely. Yeah, and I mean, I, I feel like that all the time. I feel like I, when I go out training, which I'm sure is what you feel, is that I know that I'm speaking at, at the opposite end of the spectrum of what schools are being guided to do. And it takes that really passionate leadership team um, to know in their heart the right, the right way forward to get the best out of the students. But tell me a bit about your work and where where that takes you and some of the specifics because i think you do want to yeah. -one stuff, don't you and you do training yeah. A bit of both. yeah yeah so um over the year um my day-to-day uh, -day work is one-to-one -one with permanently excluded students um uh, a turnaround where where it's possible um my uh, partner uh, and colleague is uh, very uh, well uh, informed, well versed, her background is in um, school inclusion um, at a local authority level. Um, so uh, there is uh, help for parents in that respect uh, about um, what, what, what are the next steps and getting the student back into school. Um, my job is to, is to teach them, uh, they get their 10 hours um, statutory uh, education, but part of that work is, is rebuilding. Uh, the second chance, as I, as I said at the start, um, is, is using 
um, a coaching methodology, solutions focused coaching, um, to um, help them to make sense and reconnect with school in the, in the broadest sense. Um, so day to day, I can be teaching. I can be teaching maths. I can be teaching English. I'm a history specialist, so um, I try and include a bit of Vikings or First World War, uh, depending. Um, but we've uh, I've worked with um, students as young as uh, six and uh, students up to year 11 and, and prepping them for their exams. Um, we've been successful in um, getting all but two of our students back into school, back into a, a new school, a school that's prepared to um, uh, take on a PX student. So I'm sure you know uh, the difficulty with um, convincing schools, uh, but there are still very generous schools that will give um, second chances with a bit of persuasion local authority work. Um, the other side of my work has been uh, training. Um, I, uh, I've delivered training across the country, uh, mainly in Staffordshire, uh, but I have been as far north as Yorkshire, um, and I've, I've trained on, on behaviour, on, on an approach to behaviour uh, that reflects my uh, experience, but my view of, of what works in behaviour. And what I've tried to do is to combine the two elements uh, by getting into schools, and working with the disaffected boys, principally, um, mm -hmm. disaffected students on the verge of exclusion, uh, maybe even permanent exclusion, and running a program, meeting with the students in order to prevent that from happening. Uh, I've done that in two schools, um, and the schools held on to those students. Um, so um, that's uh, almost uh, getting up, upstream of the exclusion problem and putting something in place working with students and staff to say try this uh, and it works both ways with the staff try this approach speak to them in this way explain the work in this way get them to do this and working with students as i said about potential about relationships but also about responsibility as well yeah, I like that because the uh, the attachment aware model is quite clear that having high expectations, although yesterday in the training I was doing, we decided we preferred high aspirations. Um, it, it, it felt more generous and more giving than expectations, but is, is, a, is a key part. Why, sh why shouldn't we have high expectations for our children rather than the, the limited labels um, that so many of them have to wander out of the education system with. But you reminded me that um, I used to work with uh, students at risk of exclusion in the early noughties. So it's been quite a long time since I did that. And, and oh my goodness, I wish I'd known then what I know now. How many times do we say that in a day? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, the good thing for me is that I'm learning those things now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what I wish I'd known then, um, I, I'm learning now. And I, I, always, I was always able um, to, to connect with you know, disengaged students. Um, but learning more about the, the, the particularities of ADHD, of, of autism, I mean, this fantastic work that's been done on uh, attachment, I just find utterly fascinating. Stuff that I kind of knew in my heart that was um, the, the key reason why we were getting the behaviours that we did. But to have it um, uh, uh, academically and scientifically and rationally put together as a model is absolute gold dust. And you know, as you know, the most forward thinking and progressive schools have embraced this because it, it helps you to work with these children. And at the end of the day, we want these children to be successful. We don't want them to be excluded or isolated. And the more you understand about their circumstances, about the context, the better you can support them. Um, I can only see it as. Um, uh, uh, of benefit to the education system, the more teachers learn and understand this. Uh, and I, I just all power to those schools that are, are pushing. It's the understanding that can make all the difference in those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And it is the first part of any 
training that I do because I didn't realize like so many people that teachers were not trained in human development. And this was such a shock to me um, that teachers did, were not trained in, in child development. You know, a uh, history teacher, Lisa. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a history teacher. I know lots of history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, yeah. but you know, as, as I always say, you know, have uh, who here works with children? Who here has children? Who here has ever been a child? Why on earth would it not be a fundamental part of um, that training? So I, I love the fact that we're in that place now, just as you do. Um, but how how do people access you? I mean, how do you? Um... So yeah, we we um, we, we tender uh, to local authorities. Um, the um, uh, the children uh, the the work uh, is um, uh, is put up as these students are, are totally excluded, and my colleague um, uh, bids and, and tenders for that work. So we win the work that way. Um, that's uh, the the permanent. The, the other work uh, I've just I've, I've taken on that um, uh, that freelance uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, I've bitten that bullet, and I um, you know I, I get involved on Twitter, and I've uh, I've got a brochure, and uh, I, I respond, and I uh, market uh, what I'm doing. Um, I'm at the early stages of that, but um, people pick up, don't they? People uh, people want ideas. People want. Uh, ideas and, and uh, answers or, or maybe different answers uh, to the behavior question and um, uh, I think I've got some ideas around that so um, the, the, the sad thing is Lisa uh, as you well know there is plenty of work uh, with permanent oh, exclusive yeah. young people and what's happened over the course of the year is that as we built a reputation um, we now have schools come direct to us uh, and talk about a piece of work. So um, the, the last three weeks, we're doing a really interesting piece where a local school has come to us because two young lads have been permanently excluded from their feeder primary schools just before the end of year six, which in itself raises some you know, really uh, difficult questions about the, the thinking of those schools. But um, the secondary school, the high school, has done a really generous thing and come to us and said, will you support these two young men in our school and do some work with them uh, to aid the transition? So rather than being out of school uh, and then rocking up in September, um, having been out of school for eight, ten weeks, we're doing some work with them in the high school that they're going to, um, uh, helping them to transition. Uh, but that work came direct from the school, and as we've built a reputation, that that's that's that is becoming more common. Uh, where that's an are, awesome piece of work, though. How fantastic is that? On behalf of the the high school, it's very generous of them to do that. But yeah, it is um, absolutely fascinating. Um, I mean, uh, I, I said I, I try not to stand in judgment, but you you won't be surprised to hear that both boys have special needs. Mm. Um, uh, one boy's statement was imminent um, and uh, yet he was still permanently excluded so um, some real questions to ask about the uh, about the primary schools but um, we've been able to give them uh, a far more positive experience uh, work with the school and families uh, to have those conversations about why they're in this situation and how things could be better Mm. Uh, when they start in September and um, that's what we try and do isn't it we try and give them a second chance and uh, give them equip them with enough to take that second chance and, and to build yeah. on it yeah fantastic um, I mean what's your website if anyone wants to have a look at the work you're doing yeah we are um, reflective school support and um, which is the permanently excluded work uh, and my work uh, specifically is equal parts education equal parts education brilliant i mean you know as you said there's a lot of work to do and i always feel like there is far more work than i can do and, and everyone i know feels the same so you know we have well, to yeah you do we, a lot <laughs> you do yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I mean, I, I do too much. I'm in a constant conversation with myself and with uh, the people around me, you know. I must do slightly less, I must, but you know what? I love it and I'm passionate yeah. about it. And uh, that that does mean that I probably, like so many of us, do far more work than um, than perhaps my my body would like me to do. <laughs> But long may it continue, but there is there is a, a, a big, big need out there. And um, and on we go. And it's been absolutely brilliant speaking to you, Mark. And um, I feel, yeah, I feel like I have a kind of heart connection uh, feeling about the, uh, the two lads that you're working with. And I really want things to be OK for them. Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, um, they are, um, as always in these situations, they are sweet kids. Um, yeah. they, they made a mistake. Um, and part of that is due to, uh, it, it's due to their, um, their needs. Uh, yeah. A lot of it is due to their needs. Um, but I say to them, um, you know, there's a, I do a piece around mistakes. Oh, I think. Terminal. Um, but they but they have to forgive themselves, but they also have to learn from it and they have to move forward um, and uh, hopefully they can. Uh, they, they're, they're good lads, they should do. That's brilliant. We did lose a tiny weeny bit of that there, Mark, so apologies to the listener about that. But um, it's been great to talk to you. Um, you have a fantastic evening and um, onwards we go. Yeah, you too, Lisa. A pleasure to talk to you and thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Cheers.